we really have um, most the most wonderful experts with us today for um, on site here in Tokyo and Mr. Riede will be joining us shortly online from Germany. Yeah, can you hear me? Mr. Riede, hello. Hello, hello Mr. Karpenstein, pleasure to hear you. It's see great you. to see you. The, another thing this, uh, that wouldn't probably be possible without space-related technology. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we had to, um, before I, uh, I start by introducing you, um, we had a very interesting question um, online. We didn't pick up on that because it seems a bit more like a rhetorical question. But um, the question, what gives us the right to venture out in space and, and use it or use it up? I thought this was a very interesting opening. Did you, do, do you have any comment on that? Of course, you can ask the question probably on, uh, on anything that we... Uh, that any natural resource that we that we use. I've never thought about that question. That's actually a really good question. <laughs> um, what restricts our right? I guess the other to look at it the other way. What restricts the right for us to go do that? Uh, I guess if you look at it in a colonization perspective, then we should be more sensitive. Uh, I don't have a good answer right now. I'm thinking out loud. I'm looking to my other panelists to help. <laughs> Any other comments on this uh, rather um, provocative <laughs> question, really? Immediately, uh, Sir Hillary comes to mind with because it's there. but. That's only the first reaction, of course. The moment you start uh, by exploring it, you have to think about what, how you do that. And I guess this is exactly why we are here today as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce everybody very quickly. Uh, we have about 90 minutes. We probably talk about uh, for about an hour, I would say. If you um, do have very burning questions, please make use of the opportunity to post them already online. I'm monitoring the questions, and if they relate to some of the topics that we're discussing, I'll try to um, blend them in. Um, but we'll also spend um, the last part of today's discussion um, session um, answering to questions from the audience, both here on site in Tokyo and online. Um, let me start with um, Wolfgang Riede, who is attending larger than life. He is on our big screen, um, towering above us. Um, he, uh, hello, thank you very much for the invite. Hello, Mr. Riede. Uh, Mr. Riede is head of the uh, Department Active Optical Systems at the Institute of um, Technical Physics at the German Aerospace Center in Stuttgart, southern Germany. Uh, he studied physics at the University of Stuttgart, uh, in Germany and at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and he, his expertise is development and operation of high-end laser optical ground stations. I think we'll hear a lot about that today, and also correlated technology for optical tracking and satellite laser, uh, laser ranging orbital objects. He's also involved in space qualification and testing of laser optical components, uh, one of um, our five um, experts that are with us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Riede, for making time and for getting up early to prepare for our talk. In Tokyo here, we're in the afternoon, so it's a little bit easier. Um, with us also is um, Satoshi Fumi Yanagisawa from the um, Japanese Space Agency, uh, Space Exploration Agency, JAXA. Hello, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Actually, it's a great pleasure to have you. He's um, Associate Senior Researcher um, at the Research and Development Directorate at JAXA. He received an, a PhD in astrophysics from Nagoya University and has been working on observation technology and image processing for space debris and near-Earth objects at JAXA for now 17 years, I heard. So you already have gathered a lot of expertise yes, in this yes. area. Yep, yep. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Thank you very much. 
With us also is um, Stane Lemons uh, from ESA, the uh, European Space Agency. Um, Mr. Lemons, Stane, if I may, is a senior space debris analyst. Um, he graduated with degrees in mathematics and space studies from the University of Leuven in uh, Belgium. Um, and um, you have been working with uh, ESA ever since, uh, as far as I know, as an engineer to so support operations for collision avoidance and safe um, disposal. And uh, what is probably also very important, that you advocate sustainable practices in international bodies. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about that today as well. Thank you very much. I'm also delighted to be here. Thank you very much, Stane. Um, it's a very diverse group today, I think. We have um, experts from the public sector, but also from the private sector. Um, to private organizations, let me uh, first start with Christina Nikolaus, who is the CEO and co-founder of OKAPI, Orbits, um, located in Germany, in Braunschweig. Christina, it's a great pleasure that you can join us today. Uh, Christina graduated from the uh, Technical University of Braunschweig, um, has work ex ex extensive work experience in the private sector. So uh, I, uh, I will ask you later on what uh, made you focus on, on space debris tracking and what um, got you onto a new track. Um, and I uh, also intend to make you, uh, or to wanted to ask you about um, your, your motto, making new space safer. Because this, I think, is a very intriguing question, what we can do there. It's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Chris Blackaby. He's uh, Chief Operating Officer at Astroscale, um, a, a Japanese company, as I found out yesterday. Um, it's it's um, quite amazing, really, how, uh, how many actors um, from both public and the private sector are already active in this area. And... Um, one question I think that we're discussing today is um, uh, how the, the field is developing and what kind of opportunities are also arising. We heard before uh, during the keynote um, that the, the private sector, maybe more than being a, a problem, might actually be a uh, part of the solution or being a driver of uh, innovative solutions to the problems that we're facing. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to hearing about that. Um, Chris, um, you, you have been with NASA for a long time, uh, have been also located in Japan for a long time, um, serving as a as NASA attaché for Asia at the um, US American Embassy as, as um, senior space uh, policy official and strategic space advisor. And you joined um, Astro um, scale that in 2017, you, so you have been with them also for a number of years. Yeah, about 10 years in Japan, five of with the uh, embassy and five now with Astroscale. And yes, the commercial sector should be a solution here. We will talk a lot about that. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. So thank you very much um, to all of you for being here today. Um, just to get us into the mood, um, I was wondering about this question. Um, we had a very interesting post before. Um, we talked about it, right? What gives us the right to explore space? But just in general, what um, space? Who does it belong to? How? What are the, the structures in place to deal with space? Who wants to to start? Christina, you already picked up. The can, I can go first. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I think space uh, is something which belongs to each of you in this room, including us, so it's um, something we have to take care of, as uh, Stan already said, um, and it gives us huge opportunities to solve our issues on Earth, and I think that's the reason why we're all here, because it's an interesting topic which influences and touches every one of us. Any further comments on this question? Toshi, yeah? Yeah, I think space belongs to everybody, but the, the people who want to use the space must uh, obey the rule, but the diff difficult point is how to make the rule and how to enforce the rule to everybody who want to use the space. That's a very difficult point, I think. Yeah. I think at the, uh, during the, the keynote, we already had uh, mentioning of the uh, legal framework that is in place. 
Uh, and we, we also heard from Professor Aoki that uh, the United Nations framework is, is, is a soft law, so it's, uh, it's more like guiding principles than, than constraining principles. Um, how did this structure develop? I think the, um, the, the law on, um, on, on space is from the 1960s. Uh, do you have any insights on how that developed? Maybe this is also a guideline for the future, what, what is possible and what, what might be difficult to achieve? Yeah, I, I don't want to venture too far in uh, what is clearly the field of expertise of Professor um, Aoki. Um, but uh, when you saw the initial Outer Space Treaty was formed, uh, when the space race was starting, there was an urgent need to set out a couple of uh, principles, and they're really high-level principles, that, uh, that focus the minds and that tell us uh, what, what to do and what not to do. And one important thing is essentially that nation states are responsible. They're ultimately liable for what happens in orbit or on ground, fault or absolute, we can, we can debate that. But it's nation states. And it's up to nation states to tell them if they expect something from their private entities uh, or not. That's why the amount of space loss is increasing recently because the amount of operators is actually going up as well. And maybe as a nation state, you don't want to be the complete and sole liable for what is happening out there. Um, what I think, to go to your initial question, is, is, is relevant here as well, is that we, we like to think about space as a natural, limited resource. We want to go into orbit to do something. It's limited because you cannot be with two people on the same spot, just physically, and it's natural because it's there. Where I think we disagree and where it's not completely set in stone is, is this a common resource? Is this a contested resource? Is this a pooled resource? From my personal perspective, with an environmentalist head on, it's a, it's a common resource, of course. But is this a common understanding? That's one open, uh, open question. That's actually a very good question. I was wondering about that too. I, I, ideally, it should be a common resource, and we all should take the responsibility for maintaining it, for uh, assuring that future generations uh, have the capability to use it. It should be all of ours. But the tragedy of the commons is a phrase for a reason. It's hard to, 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 to regulate that. It's, it's very difficult to take a, a commons area with no uh, overarching authority and assure that we all take care of it in the same way. I have trouble getting my two daughters to clean up our common living room together. So how do we get a, people to clean up space together and take that responsibility on themselves? Uh, it's something that is going to take significant effort from, uh, from governments working together. But to really get to a solution, I believe you, you need the commercial players because you need a commercially viable solution. We would have to rely on governments and international organizations to drive uh, policies and best practices, but government solutions doing, say, R&D on, on testing out a capability of debris removal or, or mitigation uh, I don't think that's feasible long-term. You need to have a, a commercial solution that drives it to, to make it really successful. When we're looking 10, 15 years down the line, that's how we're going to get there. It's very interesting because we have Stein's comment that uh, space exploration is still very much centered on, uh, on nation states, but at the same time, private uh, players playing a, a very um, important role. Uh, how, how do you square this? Uh, where does responsibility lie? Who, we've heard before uh, SpaceX um, has sent half of the satellites in orbit into space. So they, they do actually control a significant amount of objects that are flying out there. So how do you square these, these two areas? Um, Wolfgang, um, pl please indicate uh, with your hand if you, uh, if you want to yes. say something. Yeah. I, I keep a, uh, an eye on the screen.
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, personally, I think it's very doable. I mean, we see already in many, many countries, I mean, f first of all, that's the example ga uh, given by Professor Akao, that uh, there's more nation states registering their objects with the UN than their signatures to the registration convention that would oblige them to do so, which is fantastic to see. I think that's marvelous. It's, uh, it's going the right way. Um, with more and more countries adopting a national law, um, there is oversight, which is mandated by the Outer Space uh, Treaty as well. What I think is important when we talk about sustainable space, it's not enough to have a law, it's important what is in this law. Which is the bar that you set for your national actors in order to get access to, to space? Do they have to clean up after themselves? Do they have to comply with guidelines or do they have to follow a law to the letter? And that's a very dif uh, different thing, particularly as, a, as an operator or an engineer. And I think that's where there's room for uh, harmonization still. Thank you. Christina, yeah. Mm, and I think especially when it comes to sustainability, we need the uh, working together between the commercial sector and the legislative government side. So I think um, this was also one of the for my uh, takeaways from the um, keynote of Professor Aoki, um, that we need regulators, we need a common approach to enforce that people stick to guidelines and it should not be only a guideline that says, okay, this is how you should behave. We have some. We have to have some entity who enforces this. And we can ask ourselves, do we have to have consequences? Maybe not. Maybe we as Germany, Japan don't have to do it, but it has to be one legal um, entity who does it. Um, and I see the responsibility of the commercial sector in bringing up this solution for operators in the case to say, okay, our solutions make commercially sense. You don't only pay for sustainability for the sake of being sustainable, but you get an economic benefit with the solution. Um, you can in, uh, extend the lifetime of a satellite, for example, or you increase the service reliability if you want to monitor Earth or measure, take measurements. Um, and I think that this, uh, the commercial sector and the government legal sector should go hand in hand when we make, want to make sure that we use space sustainably. Thank you. Um, we also have representatives from JAXA, Toshifumi, and uh, from the DLR, Wolfgang. Maybe you can comment what, what's your view on, on future developments? How do you see the position of governments, of public agencies versus the, the private I'm sector? Not, I'm not still sure about, uh, can we make the common rule internationally or we just make our individual rule by our country. So what do we think? I was going to say the same thing, Toshi. I, I, it's a nice idea, but, but who is that common regulator? Uh, I don't think any So UN country, is not control. Well, UN can set best practices and can set um, you know, general international guidelines, but as far as an enforceable regulation to a nation state, they, they can't. Okay. I would totally agree that the nations have to be the enforcing entity, but we have to make sure that all have a consensus on what they regulate. But what we, for example, see in Europe is that nations implement laws which are not aligned with each other. And operators say, okay, if I'm launching from this state, maybe I go to another state to have better, a better political or a regulatory framework um, and we really have to make sure everyone sticks to get the guidelines and enforces kind of maybe not exactly the same because of national law to uh, take care of um, and to keep in mind but that it goes to the same direction I think there we have this um, entities uh, we've seen in the keynote who can take a leading position and more guidance very interesting yeah Wolfgang, what, what's your view of what uh, would be the an, an ideal future structure? Yeah, so I, I think the, the guidelines are a good thing. Uh, I think they have to be flexible and adapt to the 
to the space race, which is currently ongoing. Um, we have a, currently a first, uh, 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 first be there principle, and uh, then the, the orbits are occupied. And uh, so uh, the new technologies which are possible should be part of the of the gui guidelines, um, and 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 such such that we can trace uh, this space race and and get more safety um, in uh, in operating of of many many satellites and, and mega constellations. So for me, um, or for our institute or for DLR, I think. Uh, the, uh, the what's going on now are challenges, and as I am a technological optimist, as you are, I, I take this as a source for uh, for uh, for finding uh, technological solutions on a low TRL level or higher TRL levels, which is then then transferred to to companies, and they they can uh, commercially use that this this technology. This is. What what is my my opinion to that? I'm 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 not uh, sure uh, how much we can regulate it or how much is possible. It's certainly difficult to to do regulations. Um, my, my part is the the technological development of of uh, to to make space more safe under the current circumstances. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Maybe this is also a. Uh a good point to, to really go into the uh, the technical issues that are involved, um, approaches to make space more, more safe and more sustainable. Um, I, uh, from the keynotes, I think we, we heard there are, there are two key issues, um, tracking of objects in space and uh, also cleaning up space, cleaning up space debris. Um, and you, you all engage in, in at least one of these, these two areas. Um, Wolfgang, perhaps you can start um, by uh, telling us a little bit about the projects that the DLR is involved in with regard to monitoring of uh, objects in, in orbit. Yes, of course I can. Um, um, I am directly involved in, in the laser optical sensor technology, meaning to use sensors uh, to monitor um, the objects uh, in, in Earth orbit, uh, colleagues of me um, operate a, uh, a stational a station network, uh, which is called SmartNet, uh, which is capable of monitoring geostationary objects. And uh, so this is being done at a high TIL level, so it's operational. And in our uh, in our case, at our institute, we are working on uh, on on. Uh, developing ground station fieldable technologies which can be used as part of a network or together with radar sensors that that are uh, doing having different tasks uh, than than the laser optical sensors have to to provide more um, higher precision uh, in 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 the, in the orbit accuracy to to see um, the dynamics of objects to prepare uh, missions, which might be a robot, a robotical mission, to uh, to to extend the lifetime of a satellite of a very expensive satellite, by by in advance um, monitoring the dynamic state, the attitude uh, from ground, and uh, what what we are especially what we're current, currently doing is to place uh, optical components onto the satellite. Uh, which are, have a high synergy and correlation to the ground station, such that we can exactly monitor um, uh, the, the position or the trajectory of, of a satellite uh, by using this very cheap uh, red reflector technology. I can show you pictures on that, on that later. Uh, so um, to summarize, uh, I, I can, uh, I, I, uh, I know about the, the, uh, the optical uh, uh, projects that are uh, it, uh, allowed to improve the knowledge um, of, of, of satellite orbits or satellite objects themselves and to monitor them completely. So, um, and this is the task that we are working on um, to embed this in a, in a, in a, in a network, in a framework uh, in, in, in the future, yeah. 
Thank you very much. If you, if you have some slides, maybe that, that would illustrate your points. Um, if I understand you correctly, so this is technology that would be mounted on the satellites that are being launched or that will be launched in the future, and, and you would use the objects also to, to carry out monitoring? Yes. Uh, can you see the slides? Not yet, no. Uh, oh, yeah, I think second. now something is uh, coming in. So, can you see it now? Uh, no, unfortunately not. No, maybe we have to do that verbally then. Um, so, just a second. I think... How about now? No, we, we, we still see only you. Okay. Uh, but we're, okay. we're very happy with it too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, now, now we can see the slides. Yes. You see the slides now? So yes. So you, you should see now um, the, uh, the what you call mini SLR. It's the very compact satellite laser ground station, we, which we, is uh, yeah. um, mounted on the rooftop of our building. I think it's the smallest satellite laser ranging station which is available on, on the market or which is uh, under development at the moment. And um, it's, it's working like uh, it's emitting short laser pulses which propagate to, to a satellite and are reflected backwards um, from a uh, red reflector which is mounted on the satellite and allowing a very precise time of flight measurement um, so distance measurement to the satellite. So with this small system, uh, which is transportable, it's weighing a few hundred kilograms, you can measure the, the distance to a satellite equipped with a radio reflector down to a few millimeters. And uh, so this, and it's fieldable, it's, it's encapsulated. And this, as it's not very expensive, you can, you can use this uh, in a network uh, to, to address for certain use cases um, objects which uh, uh, orbit are not very well defined and you can get uh, uh, very precise orbits in case of a collision might might be uh, 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 in, in the future coming up in, in, in the next uh, in the next turns around the earth and uh, what we did recently and I proposed this also, at the UN Corpus uh, meeting in, in February, is that we place uh, red reflectors on uh, as an orbital payload component to satellites, which uh, uh, allow then, uh, in just in case, uh, to, to 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 measure uh, the, the the precise distance, and also as as another ish, uh, point to to use uh, kind of a license plate tagging. Uh, when we when we uh, when we have uh, different polarization states uh, um, um, in in the in the red reflectors, so we could dis discriminate one satellite from another one. So uh, th I think this this would help to to uh, to make orbits safer if this technology could be used. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, the second technology. Um, um, Wolfgang, that if we I may briefly interrupt you, up. sorry, um, because we uh, we have to show the slides here on site. And um, maybe you, if you're changing slides, maybe you can tell us which slides need to be shown. We're currently on the slide mini SLR system. Yeah. So this would be uh, this the last slide with the uh, high end laser optical ground station. Um, okay, this one. Yeah. High, high end. Okay. Yeah. The, the previous slide, please. Thank you. Did you get it? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we also operate the largest uh, reflector telescope within the European Union for monitoring orbital objects. You see here uh, on, in the picture on, on the slide on the right hand side, um, uh, what we call a Johannes Kepler Observatory. It has a really, really huge telescope aperture of 1.75 meters. And with this, we want to have a precise light curve information on light curve dynamics and light curve uh, uh, um, uh, changes uh, to assess uh, the status of a satellite for preparing service missions. For 
preparing robotic service missions, which which is useful be because uh, if you have a satellite which is tumbling or having a high rotational frequency, uh, frequency, then you might not use this as a target in first place. And uh, so, so this uh, th this will be very useful for for upcoming uh, missions to to select objects um, that can be uh, serviced or can be addressed by robotic missions. Thank yeah. you very much. What what would you say is the biggest challenge currently still to uh, to put this technology in into place? Um, it's. It's uh, the, the acceptance um, of laser optical uh, ground stations um, uh, and their reliability. Currently, we rely on, um, on radars uh, for monitoring the low Earth orbit. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, an optical ground station needs a kind of a network uh, to, to circumvent weather issues. And and so we have to we have to place them uh, all around the globe or at different places to be more operational. Um, so it, it has to be a modular uh, a unit that that can be automatically uh, operated. Uh, but we we see this mainly as a uh, as an issue for for companies for technology transfer. Uh, this 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 can be solved in our opinions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, also these systems, are, they are not too expensive. Uh, talking about the mini SLR, they are affordable and, uh, and uh, they, they, they will uh, allow, in my opinion, to make this technology more, uh, uh, address the market in the future, especially if we, if we manage to, to, to buy, hopefully, regulations to uh, for some for some uh, uh, mega constellations or satellites to to oblige uh, the operator to place radio reflectors on on the on the outer structure and this is really a cheap component yeah yeah okay thank you very much so international cooperation is also an essential element then there um, yes Toshi Fumi, um, since your um, department is also involved in in monitoring and tracking. Maybe you can introduce us, sure, um, sure. your projects. Yes. Uh, could you show us my slide? And maybe also, uh, I would be, I mean, I'm a lay person, so I'm, I'm very uh, interested in what kind of approaches are out there and also how they differ. And then I think we we'll, uh, come to Christina and the approach that uh, Okapi is taking. Okay. So, uh, so one of the problem of Space Every is the limitation of the observation ability. So current observation ability is 10 centimeter. So space debris, less than that size range, less than 10 centimeter, the situation of that size range is totally unknown. Of course, we know we can estimate the number of that, that size range, but the position and accurate orbit of those size range is totally unknown. So only even a few millimeter size of debris can cause uh, critical to the critical uh, uh, output of the uh, spacecraft. So in order to cope with the situation, JAXA uh, is developing the observation technology to, de to detect very small object. So this is, of course, JAXA doing another project relating space debris, uh, monitoring and protection and also active debris removal. But I'm in charge of space debris observation. And this figure shows the uh, remote observation site in Australia. And we are using very small telescope and commercial camera and uh, developing uh, image processing technology to detect very faint object. And the next slide, please. And here is the uh, equipment. We use CMOS camera, commercial CMOS camera, developed by Bitran. And we use also commercial 80 centimeter telescope developed by Takahashi. By using this equipment, we can cover 4.4 by 2.5 degree region of the sky. And in the future, uh, we will 
develop. Uh, we will uh, apply a, a lot of sensor to cover the vast regions of the sky. And for the analysis process, we are developing stacking method. Uh, the left lower figure shows the concept of the method. Basically, we use uh, many CCD, many frames to detect very faint, very faint object that is invisible on a single frame. So we developed those system, and currently we can detect uh, 10 centimeter area object in real time basis. So next slide, please. So this figure shows the result of the area of the object survey observation. And the light figure shows the detected uh, brightness dispersion of a detected object in the survey. X axis is the brightness of the target and Y axis shows the number of the detected object. And blue column is a catalog object and red column is the uncatalog object. And typical size are shown in the table. And as you can see, we can detect 10 centimeter and 20 centimeter uncatalogued object using a very small telescope and using a very, I mean, commercial sensors. So we develop uh, the system and a large amount of data taken by the CMOS camera became to be analyzed using the multi PC and FPGA machine and GPU machine in almost real-time basis. So uh, we would like to expand this observation network to cover whole region or whole size range of the space debris in the near future. Thank you very much. This sounds to me, uh, you mentioned that you're using sort of well, regular commercial telescopes. This yes, sounds to yes. me like a, a, an approach that doesn't require yep. incredibly yep. new inventions. Um, and it, it's, if I picture it, uh, 10 centimeters objects um, yes. that are hundreds of kilometers up in the sky. This is yes, actually very that's, impressive. That's correct, that's correct. Th that's, that's a very interesting um, question from the audience. Um, what, what influence does light um, pollution have of, on monitoring? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah wondering, so we have to correct yeah. very dark sky. So uh, our observation site is located in very remote area to keep the dark sky. Yeah. And do you, do you also make use of, of several sites so that you can sort of um, um, collect data and um, create like an, uh, an overall uh, picture? Yep. In, in the future, picture? I would like to do such kind of task to collect the data and uh, determine the orbit and keep the orbit and uh, provide those data to public. And those data are used for the collision avoidance yeah. warning, something like this. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe we can also have um, Ms. Nikolaus' uh, presentation slides. There's one thing that I wanted to ask you about. I, uh, I warned you ahead of time. I, I'm very curious. You, you were working in the private sector for a number of years before you founded Okapi. Um, and your uh, co-founder is also present here today. Um, what what um, made you redirect your steps? Or is this something that's, that sort of naturally uh, evolved out of your, your previous work? Um, I think it di did not evolve of my previous work. It was more um, a lot of coincidences coming together. That's how I ended up in space. And I think space, I strongly believe that space is the new technology frontier. It's not cars anymore, it's space. Um, and that's why I ended up in space. Um, I, together with my co-founders, who did a lot of research on topic of long-term simulation of space debris behavior, and also radar simulations. Um, and we saw 2018 when we had the first thoughts about uh, commercially uh, opening up the research heritage we had, um, that the market was in a tip point. We saw it in the numbers of satellite launch in 2018. And we saw, okay, we have this really strong heritage from the 70s, from the Technical University of Braunschweig, who um, worked on this topic for a really long time, and saw the market is changing. So we now uh, wanted to open up the research and started off with the copy orbits. Yes. And uh, since there are already projects in place at, at uh, the Technical University of Braunschweig, what, what um, sort of was the deciding factor that you thought uh, sort of creating a startup in this area would be a better way to proceed? Um, because I think 
being a commercial company brings also a lot of benefits in being able to act faster. That's already one, one issue. And uh, especially serving the commercial side is, I assume, easier as a startup. I've never been in the research side, so um, I don't know about this. Um, but um, being a startup, we start off with four people in a basement, kind of. Um, it gave us a lot of flexibility. Uh, we're really fast in creating the first prototypes, bringing out to the market, gathering data, acting really freely and independently, also internationally, and serve the customers what we think is a really good solution. Yeah, thank you. Before I ask you about the approach that your company is, is taking on monitoring, maybe you can have this, the, the next slide, because um, you have a video that illustrates what is called the Kessler syndrome. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, so what we see here, um, I think soon there will be red uh, objects. You see, it, uh, this was a collision of two objects, the red dots. And the Kessel syndrome is a chain reaction of space debris obje objects colliding with each other and forming huge clouds of space debris. And this is, um, I think it was a 2009 uh, collision of the Iridium satellite um, in the cosmos. And you see the space debris cloud is getting bigger and bigger, the particles get smaller and they spread. Um, and that's basically also what we see with the anti-satellite test. So you have one object fragmenting and a lot of objects exponentially growing. And what's really, um, what's really dangerous about it is that an object of one centimeter size is already pretty dangerous because they're moving with like nine kilometers per second. That's kind of comparable to a bullet. Um, so they have a huge impact when they collide and can destroy, in worst case, even the whole satellite. I, th I think this is a, a mind-boggling illustration, really, of the problem of space debris. Like all these objects circulating uh, around the globe. Um, some very small, I'm, I'm really impressed actually what is possible already, what you can, can track even 10 centimeters from, from, from this far away. It's very impressive. But you're saying that, that you actually also need to worry about the much, much smaller pieces that uh, eventually we... I, ideally, you would, would be able to, to track pretty much everything that is out there in orbit? Mm, yeah, I would say in an ideal world, of course, the more we see, the better. Because with this, we understand better what's going on. And as I, as I just said, small objects can be also dangerous. Um, but I think now we have to act with the things that are out there, the great technology we, technology we already have, um, and make the most out of it. To, because what this shows is that we have to mitigate risk because we have our colleagues here who can take care of everything what's up there since decades of space usage, but we have to make sure that we don't end up in this situation, have multiple collisions, because then, even if we have great companies to take care of this, this will be an even tougher challenge to solve. Uh, how serious is the situation? Maybe a question also to the others. I mean, how, how much of orbit is already problematic? I mean, how, how many open windows do we still have? Is there, do you have an estimate for that, Stain? Yeah. Yes. First of all, great point, Christina. I mean, before we can clean up, we should stop polluting. Because the smaller the debris gets, it can still impact your spacecraft. You cannot see it, you cannot avoid it, and it's there. So if we talk about numbers, so in, in this <laughs> close shell, which we call low Earth orbit, so the first 2,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, there's a region between, say, 700, 900 kilometers where the debris which you create there essentially stays there for centuries. It doesn't decay, it will move out in a shell around it, so it will affect everyone who passes through there or is there. And that de facto means that if you have a mission there, which is where most of the meteorological satellites and some of the telecommunication satellites sit, you are going to have to dodge debris two or three times a year. And this is an exponential problem. Uh, it wasn't there 20 years ago, uh, and it will keep on going up if we do not take care about the pollution. Thank you. And we also have Mr. Reader back on uh, screen, please. Um, so, Christina, what, what's the approach that uh, Okapi is taking to monitoring, and uh, how does it compare to the, what the DLR um, is doing, what JAXA is doing? Um, yeah, so simply saying, uh, we make sure that satellites don't crash into space debris or other active satellites. 
Uh, that's basically the really simple version. To make it slightly more technical, uh, we collect data, for example, similar to SmartNet, other technology we've seen, um, from laser ranging stations, radar stations, telescopes, and uh, to some extent also in orbit sensors, um, create a map of where all the space debris objects are, where the active satellites are, soon also the maneuvers, so we collect maneuvers, we see how do um, active satellites behave in space, how do they interfere uh, with each other, and based on this catalog or data set, we provide an optimal maneuver plan. So we tell the satellite operators, okay, you have to use your propulsion in a certain way um, to get out of the danger zone of colliding with, with an object. Um, and this also goes to the extent, so we cover the whole life cycle of a satellite. It's from mission analysis, so making sure, okay, what do you have to consider when planning to learn something, um, to the really end part of the life cycle of how do you re-enter, how do you deorbit without keeping and uh, having an impact or leaving something behind. Um, and yeah, it's a software tool, so we don't own the uh, sensors, but we collect data from different data sets. It was actually a very interesting question from the audience. Um, Will, um, with regard to um, JAXA, the, the JAXA data, w whether this would be made public, for example, but I think this, this question about data is very valid in general. Uh, would, would such data um, on objects circulating Earth, would it be made public at some point? Would it be a public good that everybody could access? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I hope uh, that data will be public, but uh, I'm not the JAXA director, so <laughs> I can answer the question. But I, the, ideally, we can share all the data and uh, everybody can access the data and understand what the situation is. So that's my hope in the future. Yeah. Wolfgang, maybe your comment. Uh, are there um, already attempts to, to share data, to create like a, uh, um, an international database for, for objects, something like that? Yeah, oh, oh, there, there is one. Uh, it's the two-line element database, um, which has uh, several disadvantages. So everyone, everyone can uh, uh, access that. Uh, first of all, uh, the data are not very precise. So um, if, if you make a measurement now, uh, a few days later, uh, your satellite might be a few kilometers at a different, a long track position. And this makes, would make the difference when you uh, want to calculate a collision, a, a collision risk. So this is the first thing. And secondly, what we found with our uh, observations by using staring cameras as well, that about 30% of the objects are not part of this two-line element catalog. And this, I don't know wh where they are cataloged, uh, and, and, but, but this is not a complete catalog. Uh, so th this is the first comment, and uh, the second is that the uh, the data from the SmartNet, which was mentioned twice, which is operated by DLR, uh, it's a, 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 a network of of, uh, of uh, um, telescopes, global global network. This is open, so and every everybody can join uh, by bringing in sensors. Uh, and, and then all the data are shared between this community, as I understand that. And uh, so if you, as, 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 as soon as we are op operational with our sensors, I, I think uh, we, we will be uh, able to provide, to, to, to provide this data um, if, uh, to, to, um, if, if there are requests. So this, this should not be a problem, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we've heard about um, different approaches to monitoring um, space debris. Um, the second big issue, of course, that we have to address is what we're going to do once we know where every piece is. Uh, and I think um, now we come to uh, Chris and Stain. Um, what are technologies that are already in place or that are currently being developed to, to address this problem of space debris? And I think we already heard different um, keywords. Um, sort of cleaning up, um, also avoiding, of course, creating um, creating um, debris. Um, Chris, do you want to start? 
There's been so much I want to say over the last 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, it's great to hear all of the speakers here around the world. And uh, just watching that video, isn't it just impactful? I mean, that's what's happening right now. And it's going to get worse. There's going to be another iridium cosmos-like collision. Uh, and now it's with... How many, how many satellites were in orbit when the Iridium Cosmos collision happened? 2,000 maybe? 1,500? Now there's close to 8,000? You know, you don't have to be a, a math major to recognize that that's a problem. And we better start taking steps to solve it. And one of the first things I think, in, even before the technical side, is awareness. Uh, you know, we have some space experts in the room here, but I think not everybody here is a space from the space sector. But now, now you're aware. And it's this, it's this idea of spreading this, uh, the urgency of this issue. And one of the things you said, Christina, was the, uh, the concern that, I think if I can paraphrase, it was like a race to the bottom, uh, the potential that someone would see lesser regulations at a launching state that didn't have as many uh, requirements and go there because they don't have to pay as much. And I want to see a race to the top. I want to see an awareness of the society, of the urgency of this issue, and people say, not I want to go to a place that has less regulations to launch or I want to get my satellite licensed by a country that doesn't make me put on retro reflectors, as we just heard from our colleague in Germany that doesn't force me to remove my debris. I want to get to a place where companies say, I want to go there because my customers are demanding it. The same way that we don't want to buy clothes from places that are developed or build, or, you know, making these clothes, manufacturing in, in, in sweatshops or in, in, in inhospitable uh, areas. It, it maybe sounds a bit too naive, but I think that's where we have to get to. So I'll start with that. I'll do quickly now on the technology. Um, so cleaning up all of those tiny pieces of debris that we talked about is not feasible. It's not feasible technically. It's not feasible you know, politically. Uh, we need to clean up the large pieces so they don't become big pieces. And there are a lot of big pieces up there that we need to bring down failed satellites, uh, upper stage rocket bodies that have been used. We talked about the 10 centimeter objects. Yes, they're, they're deadly to satellites. The even smaller are deadly. Uh, we're also looking at these 200 kilogram satellites up to seven ton rocket bodies and satellites. City buses, a city bus spinning in an orbit of, usual, of satellites that are being used. So risk to satellites and our use of them, and, and risk now to people. Yesterday, they, some of them come down, but there were 17 people in orbit yesterday. 17 people in space. With Chinese space station, with ISS, and with Axiom, the, the commercial space provider. Some have come down since, but people are at risk. So what we're trying to do at Astroscale is uh, secure the safe and sustainable use of space for the benefit of future generations. We want to prepare future satellites for being removed. We want to remove current debris. And we want to help repair and extend the life of satellites that maybe are about to become debris. Uh, the, the easy way to consider it is like uh, in America, it's triple A. In Japan, it's JAF, Highway Road Service. Picture that big city bus that I just said in orbit, picture it on the ground, spinning down the highway. And we can track it and tell people where it is, but avoiding it takes a, an operator who is paying attention, uh, and it takes use of fuel to get out of the way of that city bus. That's what's happening in space. So we can tell them where it is, but it takes an effort to avoid it. So we want to get that bus out of the way. 
And so we're building a capability to identify, approach, and dock with debris in orbit. Uh, one of, we have a few different mission lines. One is to prepare those satellites before launch by putting a docking plate on the satellite. So similar to the retro reflector, prepare it before it launches so that it can be more easily retrieved in the future. And so the docking plate that we're proposing has a ferromagnetic surface so that we can come up and attach to it with a magnet, approach and attach with a magnet, and then bring it down. We've tested that technology with our first mission that's in orbit right now, uh, and then we're continuing to have other missions in our pipeline uh, that are being developed right now. Our second mission are, is actually launching this year with JAXA, uh, the Commercial Removal uh, Demonstration, Debris Demonstration Mission, CRD2. We have a satellite called ADRIS, Active Debris Removal by Astroscale. The first phase of this mission is going to be to go up to a JAX, uh, an H2 uh, rocket, upper stage, and circle around it, take pictures of it, understand it in orbit. Uh, the second phase, which is still, we're waiting on the RFP from JAXA to get released, but the second phase will be to actually dock with and remove that upper stage. So that's that second step, bringing down debris that's currently in orbit. And then we're also prepared to service satellites. Go up to a satellite, sometimes in the LEO, sometimes in GEO, and extend its life. Uh, allow it to continue to provide service by either refueling it or repairing it or keeping it centered on the right place. So we have a variety of technical options that we're building out, all of which are going to help contribute to sustainability in orbit. Thank you, yeah. Uh, to, to make it easier to, to recollect them, satellites, um, to, to collect current um, objects of debris in, in an object, and also to send up sort of a, uh, a, a, a low orbit AAI, like a, a, a service uh, crew uh, or some, some sort of device that, that would actually um, repair satellites and enable them to be longer in space. Yeah. Basically, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think I have a hard time picturing that how that would work because Christina said, you know, these objects, they're, they're circulating Earth at this incredible speed. So uh, what would be involved in, in docking uh, next to them or sort of docking them? And, and also, how would you remove them? What, what happens to them? You collect them, you bring them back to Earth? Uh, in, in low Earth orbit, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, like Christina said, nine kilometers a second, a speeding bullet. Uh, having to come up to that object uh, and then come close enough to it and map the rotation of that object if it's spinning, to spin around with it, and then move in and grab onto it. Uh, the relative speed at with it, which it's going has to be equal when it gets there. So it's not like you're literally trying to catch a speeding bullet here. I mean, you're getting to that relative speed as well. Uh, but the challenge is significant. Uh, and so what we've already tested in orbit is the capability to m monitor and stay with that object autonomously and track it. And then slowly, safely, move up closer, approach, and dock. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it, a lot of the technology has been done when there's been communication between them. You look at the Hubble servicing mission, the Hubble, that service the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, docking with the ISS. You know, docking in orbit is possible and been done for decades. We're also trying to do it at a commercially viable level, something that a customer would look at and say, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for that. Uh, government missions are hard to make commercially viable. So we need to try to improve that technology so we can do it repeatably and economically. Okay, thank you. Stane, maybe let's come to you. What, what are projects that your institute uh, is involved in, uh, ESA in general, or the institute that you work at in uh, Darmstadt in Germany? 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of things to, to jump into here, and I'm going to try to wriggle my way through the four points which we actually heard here, because in the end, they're, they're all related to each other. They cannot, can, it's very hard to decouple them. Uh, but maybe point zero first, and in the point of raising awareness, uh, maybe for the audience it's relevant to know that even if we stop all launches today, we don't add a single object to the environment uh, as of now, the most likely outcome is that the amount of debris keeps on increasing because of what is already there and it's going to collide. So this natural sink, it's, it's not there. In, uh, in many ways, you can argue that we're actually trying to play catch up. So um, what are we doing? So uh, first of all, indeed, I'm part of the uh, European Space Operations Centers based in, in Germany, in Darmstadt, and this is essentially where ESA operates most of its missions from. This can be interplanetary. We recently lost a satellite to, to JUICE, but also the Copernicus fleet, which is a, a mission of, at the moment, 10 satellites funded by the European Union uh, to monitor the, the Earth uh, for, for climate change purposes or for observational purposes. So it has a, a, a wide spectrum, and this wide spectrum of missions gives also a, a, very, a very good overview of what, what, what is at stake. I mean, maybe to get personal for a moment, when I started there about 12 years ago, I went into operations, and I was there to support missions implementing collision avoidance maneuvers. This was a relatively fun exercise because you know where the debris is coming from, it doesn't move, you can make nice uh, predictions, and it didn't happen that often, if we're honest. But that's no longer true. There's something we haven't mentioned at, at the moment since 2018 as well. It's no longer debris which is out there, it's also more and more active operators. And those, uh, they're not so nice to predict they have opinions of their own. They might disagree with what the risk is and that, um, uh, that a close encounter is actually risky. So you have to start communicating. It's not just passive versus active. You need to, to talk about it as well. Um, so in this... So, so to interrupt, is there a, uh, some sort of framework in space, in, in, in place, not in space, <laughs> in place for space, for operators to communicate? You, 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 traffic com control. you preempt me. Uh, <laughs> so there is none. Email or fax is uh, what used to be the most common because sometimes, and particularly now with so many different operators, you might, you might not know who is your point of contact of a CubeSat launched from a, a state far beyond your borders. There's no centralized phone book which is complete where you can go look up this information. There's many attempts though and it will drive what I think we need to do in terms of developments um, to, to make that point. Um, but the, the state of play is, is not that great. Let's make no uh, mistake about that. So what, what do we do? So uh, it's ESA and its operations center in Darmstadt has a second pillar which is called uh, Space Safety Program. ESA works with member states of which uh, Germany is a major contributor and particularly when it comes to, to safety aspects uh, as well. Uh, and this is where we try to uh, push technologies forward to, to deal with the, the four problems we, uh, we heard. And I just want to highlight uh, a, f a, few of, a few of them. First on this coordination uh, mechanism. As I said 10 years ago, a startup like Okapi would not be thinkable because there was just not that much to, to coordinate with. Now technologies to, to support startups and to support coordination mechanisms and to automate this process is very much in our investment uh, line and to make sure that this can be demonstrated commercially as well and to be made available to as wide of a public uh, as possible. That's one. Secondly, um, there's a mission in uh, development as well, some with multiple uh, providers, among others also Astroscale, to demonstrate that it's actually possible to capture um, uh, an uncontrolled object and bring it back down into, into the atmosphere. Um, there's many ways to do this. There's hundreds of technologies being proposed. There's going to be only a few viable, of course. Um, but we need to try this out. And I think with respect to the first point we said uh, today, this is where there's a role for government. It's, it's, we, we cannot do this as a government agency, as a commercial basis, but to make sure that there's seeding for this technology to demonstrate them, because this is a risky endeavor. This, uh, that, that is part of this, uh, this mandate as well. So hopefully by 2026, um, uh, 
300 kilogram sized, let's say two meter diameter uh, radius objects of, uh, of ESA will be removed safely, if all goes well, of course. Lastly, in terms of technologies that are being uh, put forward is we have to stop polluting. And I cannot stress it enough. There's no cleaning up if you keep the tap open. So within the space safety program, there are the developments together with industries to make sure that uh, objects can be reliably disposed of. Just to give general figures here as well, back in 2014, wise men and women thought that um, to make a cut in the debris environment, every object in low Earth orbit had to dispose itself within 25 years with a success rate of about 90%. So one in 10 object was allowed to fail and to, to strand. If you make the same calculations today with the new uh, um, uh, volumes of traffic, we're talking about disposing in one year with 99.9% .9 reliability, which is technologically hard to achieve because it means asking from your operator that you have a perfectly working spacecraft and you decide af actively to turn it off and get it out of orbit before its end of life is reached. So it's, it's not something fun we ask of operators, but it's something which is absolutely necessary uh, to, to achieve a long-term sustainability. So those are the accesses we are uh, working on. Thank you very much. Um, we are all aware of these scenarios that um, have been proposed for the future development of, of uh, the, the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe. We have an, an optimistic scenario, a realistic scenario, a worst case scenario. What would be the scenarios for, for space debris? If we, uh, if we choose uh, 2030, for example, right? That's uh, seven years down the road. What, what would be, in, in, your, in your all opinion, a, uh, a realistic scenario? So 2030 is not a problem because this, um, this cascading effect you've seen plays out over centuries. Centuries, when you were talking about the environment, um, let's say 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, in the worst case scenario, and for me that is if all um, actors, including large constellations, would follow current recommendations, models and their models, so you can argue a pro or con against them, would predict that this exponentially increase would start in a couple of decades from, uh, from now. Um, but it's hard to stop once it's there, and that is the real, uh, the real problem. So what we do now is the seed for a couple of decades from now. Any additional comments on, on the future outlook for us? Chris, yeah. I think it's I think it's more immediate than that even, and I know you. I mean, a couple of decades. Uh, yeah, that's probably. You know, it's a centuries-long problem. I think the the, the the risk is it happens even earlier than this, uh, and that we're not ready for it. And I, I have a, a some of the models I see. See, I see that you know it says that centuries problem, and I think. Back to the idea of messaging, people look at that and be like, my, my great grandkids will be gone by then. I don't care. <laughs> That's centuries away. I think we need to make it really clear that this is an immediate problem. Now, you're right, 2030, I think, is still pretty soon. Um, but how many of us in December 2019 thought that we would be sitting in our homes for three years because of a global pandemic? Probably not many. Not many of us thought like that was a risk that we were preparing for. And so I think if we say that this is not a risk we're preparing for, we have the, 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 the significant, uh, viable danger that it's going to kick us in the back and, and we're not going to be ready for it. So the, the worst case scenario I see is that in 15 years, uh, my kids are looking at this video that you had done just there and said, wait, this was from 2020? And you guys didn't do anything? And now, because of that, we can't utilize <clears throat> our orbits or we can't have the same access to uh, information that we had when I was a kid? What, what, why didn't you do anything? Like, like I see that, that kind of, that, that is the worst case scenario to me. 
is that it comes much faster than we think and, and we have sold a generation down because we didn't take action. Uh, the best case scenario is that we start taking action right now. And it is a government and commercial solution working together to, 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 to make this one of the most you know, serious uh, existential crisis points of our time, frankly, not to be too, too uh, hyperbolic about it, but it, it is, it, it, you know, it, it, gets, it gets to that, to that point, frankly. Um, so I think that we need to really take that, that step to, to, to start addressing this as a government and commercial side. I think that's a, an important point uh, that cannot be overstated, how important it is to act quickly to prevent a, uh, a major catastrophe uh, further down the road. Um, let's, let's open up the, uh, the forum to questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I, I uh, still have several questions also. But uh, yes, Mr. Reinke, Niklas. Thank you all for your very enlightening uh, information and uh, talks today. Chris, uh, my favorite question to you. Um, who do you think, I mean, as a commercially operating uh, enterprise, who will be your customers in future? Who will pay for cleaning up space? In the near term, it's, it's governments. It's the ones who put most of the, uh, the objects in orbit over the last multiple decades. Uh, and, and they're taking that responsibility to the credit of ESA, JAXA, uh, the UK Space Agency, uh, NASA, their, to the G7 statement that we referenced earlier. They're, they're ref recognizing that this is an issue and they need to start investing in a solution. So for us, our near-term customers primarily are governments who are doing R&D spending and full missions. Uh, Going forward, we see the commercial sector as a customer. Um, I think you're referencing the Sunrise uh, mission with, with ESA and, and OneWeb that, that we're working on where, where we're going to be demonstrating a capability with, uh, with a OneWeb satellite in orbit. Um, we see that there's going to come a point once we can successfully really prove the technology or, or show the commercial sector that we can really do this uh, and we start this ecosystem moving, we're going to be seeing interest from the commercial companies to say this is something that is going to benefit them. Uh, removing these debris is going to benefit them going forward. So in the end, both near-term government more, long-term commercial. Any additional questions? One, yes, Stein. It's not a question, but, uh, but, uh, but an easy remark, because initially we also stated that there is room for, for national laws to, to intervene. One of the very easy wins, from my perspective, is the technologies like Herid has, uh, has discussed. Laser radio reflector makes sure that a service afterwards can better track where you are, and hence collisions can be avoided. Similar for ADR, having a little handle on top of your uh, space mission has a very limited mass impact, but ensures that if th something does go wrong, you can be serviced and, you can, and then a satellite operator cannot use the argument anymore, but yeah, I'm tumbling too fast, there's no way that I can get this out of this. So I, I think there's a, a two parallel lines. Maybe it does not immediately imply a commercial market for, for active debris removal, uh, but there's certainly a step to be taken right now that we can ensure that uh, precursor technologies are on board for the technologies of tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Um, one question that I had, um, since we're here um, gathered today um, with experts from Japan, from Germany, from the United States as well, um, we, we've also talked about international um, cooperation uh, against the background of us trying to connect, especially Germany and um, Japan. I was wondering, and maybe a question then to, to Toshi and to, to Wolfgang, um, what, what are the, the strengths of German-Japanese cooperation? Or maybe at the same time, what kind of role should Germany and Japan assume in the future? I think it's a difficult question, but uh, JAXA, 
maybe um, already some sub collaboration with DLR, I think. And uh, we Jacks are, are very open to collaborate each each other. Any space agency will be welcome, I think. So I think international collaboration is uh, very important to cope with this situation in the future, I think. Wolfgang, something to add? Yeah, I, I just can add that, that we have common uh, technology areas, which is uh, optical, laser optical ground stations, and also um, red reflectors. Um, if you could join forces, which we all already did partially, uh, the, uh, this, this would be great. So um, in, 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 in my field, I, I see these two um, possibilities, um, which, which we can uh, extend where we can extend cooperation for sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Wolfgang. Any additional questions from the audience, online or offline? Yes, there's a question over there. So thank you very much. Uh, it's not a question. Uh, the last question was for, uh, from me, and what is the strong point between Japan and and German cl collaboration. And so my idea is that uh, the common thing between Japan and Germany is peaceful, peaceful uh, utilization of space. And uh, um, ja Germany and Japan always think, always, uh, think about peaceful solution of problems. Therefore, if uh, Japanese and German people say, uh, for example, let's let's use space clean and peaceful, then this statement is very persuasive. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. This, this also brings us to the question we, we talked about how uh, important the military sector used to be. It's, it's, uh, I think the share has, has gone down because there's so much commercial activity now. But I'm, I'm also wondering what, what kind of, I mean, because obviously military applications, military technology, military devices um, pl still play a big role, how, how this impacts the, the whole issue. I mean, obviously there's a problem, I would assume, with, with data sharing. <laughs> Problem also in terms of um, figuring out uh, sort of international solutions to the problem. Any comments on that? There's one uh, thing that you have to keep in mind. Nobody likes to lose their satellite, particularly not when it's working uh, well. So it, in my experience, well, and it's, it's the same with the, with the phone book, uh, you will try to do your best to, to save your satellite and to exchange uh, what is needed. What is needed might, might not be a very high bar, um, but there clearly is uh, a com common interest. Is military versus civil really the, the right question to, uh, to ask, or is it about the, the general question is how do we coordinate in, in, uh, in orbit? Because if there is, just to be provocative, a CubeSat of a university which was launched for a couple of uh, hundred, uh, thousands of, uh, of euros, uh, and which, I don't know, it's coming close, but I cannot reach anyone because students don't work 24 hours per seven. Well, maybe they do, but maybe not on this particular weekend. Uh, it's as dangerous as a military satellite, which I cannot reach. So. It, it, the, the real point is to make sure that there are coordination mechanisms which have a common intersection, a common understanding of the risks involved, and a common reachability, independent of which flag or funding agency that brought your object uh, up there. If there are additional questions, just raise your hand. We'll uh, um, direct the microphone then to you. Chris, do you want to add something to Stain's comment? The question of military funding is always a difficult one, um, and and we are we are fully uh, focused on uh, sustainable development uh, in the civil side. But but I think to your point also everybody wants to see a sustainable orbital environment no matter what your mission is. 
Uh, and we do see uh, an increased interest from security agencies around the world in, in funding uh, some of the activities that I think we're all doing. And uh, yeah, the, I can understand the sensitivity around that. Uh, but I also think when we look at technology development, a lot of it has started through military funding. Um, internet, GPS. I mean, that would not have happened without funding from military. Uh, in, in the US, the, the highway system, you know, basically was starting to move military material around the country. All of that is civil use right now. So it's a sensitive issue that we're always wrestling with, but we also see that there is interest and investment, and so we'll, we'll look into it. Thank you. Um, I, I don't see any additional questions um, online, um, and we are slowly approaching the end of our discussion today. Uh, maybe in conclusion, I'd like to ask everybody of you, um, um, if, if, if you have one thing that you, that you hope for in the near, near future, something that, that should happen, um, if, if it was in our power, we would be maybe able to, to make that happen. But if there's the, what's the, the main thing that you hope will happen in the near future to help go ahead with the, the issue? Um, who, who wants to start? Christina? Okay, go first. Um, so, um, if I look at the future and we want to make space use sustainable, I think what's really, really important is to bring all actors in space to one table. And I think this is really an utopia, I'm thinking, and it's re really, really hard to achieve. But um, we have to sit at a table um, and find a way to share data and to communicate, to coordinate, because if we don't do, then people are left out um, and something what we've shown in the video can happen more likely. So. I think we have to talk to each other and bring all stakeholders to one table. Would, would you picture nation states sitting at the table or really a, a very large table including all sorts of actors? I think everyone who's active in space. It, it cannot be the nations alone. It has also to involve the commercial players, the military players, but also of course the states who are launching spacecraft. And um, they have to sit together and talk about the mechanisms we have to implement. Is it radio reflectors or collision avoidance routines or more tracking or sharing data? So, yeah. Thank you. What are you hoping for, Toshi? Go next. Okay, uh, so we are developing the technology and uh, maybe ADR is, technology of ADR is also improving and monitoring technology is also improving. So by combining these issues and uh, on top of that, uh, we are trying to make some good rule. So all of this, by combining all these aspects, uh, we can use our space in safe manner. That's my hope. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Who wants to go next? Uh, Wolfgang Stein, Chris. Wolfgang, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can. Um, so I think um, uh, there should be an awareness um, of our dependence on Earth, uh, uh, of our dependence on on a functioning space and uh, and space orbits. This this should be progressed. And for for this, I, I consider this this workshop um, today um, is very helpful to to uh, progress this these issues uh, such that. We we uh, we might get more more um, uh, funding money to 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 address uh, the problems in, in in the future. So I I, I confirm what what Chris and, and Stein and Christina has have said um, that that uh, we we have to rely on on a functioning orbit and uh, we we cannot allow uh, allow to to be uh, to be to to lose this ecosystem up there. Um, because it's important, and uh, so there must be an awareness uh, in, in the public as well, um, such, such that the people understand that we, uh, there should be um, uh, m m money be addressed uh, to 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 to, uh, to to make sure that orbits are more safe in the future again. Yeah, 
I hope, I sincerely hope that our event today contributed to raising awareness. Maybe one positive yes. note is the, the large number of people who have registered both online and, and offline. Um, Chris Stain, one, one gets the last word and the other person can go. Oh, I was going to say, I should have gone ahead of Wolfgang because I was going to say awareness. Awareness without tragedy, is what I was going to say. Uh, if a tragic situation happens, yeah, we're going to be aware. Uh, how can we get the right level of awareness without tragedy? So um, that's, that's incumbent on all of us to, to get out there and continue to spread the word because exactly what was just said, uh, that positive feedback loop that comes from this uh, viral messaging uh, is what's going to drive investment, which is what we're looking for from you know, VCs. It's what's going to drive missions. Uh, it's what's going to drive political action. So that's, I will second it, being unoriginal. Thank you. Stein, you get the last word then today. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, after being an operator and seeing in what environment we are, I went into preaching. That's why I'm very happy to be in this environment and to talk about space sustainability. So what I think we should do is, first of all, be aware that we actually have technologies and that we actually know what the right thing to do is already now. Nobody here mentioned that there's more research needed on the, on the problem, um, because frankly, it isn't. So what I wish for is that um, we stop talking about guidelines, uh, soft laws, but make as part of your license to go into orbit space sustainability requirements mandatory across the, the globe, and then we can finally put a tap in, in the hole. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope this is what will happen. Um, thank you very much, um, all of you, for attending today. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I, I hope. The event has also contributed to raising awareness of the issue. Um, like I said, the, the numbers are mind-boggling. I think it's beyond what, what I sort of had at the back of my mind, what the problem actually is. Um, but we, we've also heard about um, different approaches, possible solutions to tackle the issues involved. Um, hopefully, we can stay optimistic and we'll see some progress. We've, we've heard some um, avenues that, that hopefully will be taken. Um, stricter regulations actually that, that uh, would contribute to, um, to preventing um, additional problems, maybe also actors coming together, hopefully, um, a round table and, and coordinated efforts. Um, thank you very much uh, to the five of you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, um, your assessment of the issues today with us. Um, thank you very much all.